wonder about the awesomeness of the Lord. Amen? And so God wants to do that for you too. And I believe that we are entering into that season of wonder. And so I want to talk to you this morning about miracles. And we're going to get a little bit into the, uh, the Christmas story, but we'll be moving into that over the next couple Sundays more. But Luke chapter 1, just verse 34 and 35. Jesus' life started as a miracle. His conception was miraculous. And so uh, what we see in verse 34 and 35 is uh, Mary says this to the angel Gabriel. She says, hey, how will this be? Since I am a virgin, and the angel answered and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And so God is always looking to perform wonderful, miraculous things in our life. Why is that? It's because God is supernatural. God is beyond natural. We live in a world that's based on natural physics and natural things, uh, a material world, but, uh, as Madonna would say. But the, the fact is, is that, is that God is supernatural. And God is beyond all of these natural laws and everything else. And so uh, for God to perform a miracle is actually quite natural, isn't it? God is supernaturally natural. And so it's no big deal for God to perform unusual things. I was looking up in, in the dictionary uh, this week uh, the word miracle because I wanted to get a definition for it. And the definition that I found uh, for miracle in, in the Merriam-Webster dictionary said this. A miracle is an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention and in human affairs. So how many of you have already experienced a miracle when Jesus came to live in your life and wash away all of your sins, amen? And so not only is God supernatural, but when we come to Jesus Christ, we become a new creation in Christ, and we actually become supernatural people. And so it makes sense that there should be supernatural, miraculous things taking place in all of our lives. God wants us to just be amazed and in awe of the things of the Lord. What was interesting is when I looked at that definition of the word miracle, uh, I looked at the etymology, how the word came to be, and it said that it came to be in the 12th century, that it was a, from the Latin, and the Latin uh, mirari, which actually means to wonder and to marvel. And I said, God, isn't that amazing? You want us to have a season of wonder. This is going to be a season of the miraculous. God wants to do something in our lives. Now, whenever God does something and performs a miracle, usually we see that God is always trying to work in partnership with someone. And so in the story of Mary, uh, this, this virgin uh, young woman that lived on the other side of the tracks in, in Nazareth in a drab town, here's an ordinary God. The angel shows up and all of a sudden everything becomes extraordinary. But Mary had to get involved in the miracle. So some of us are going to have to get involved in the miracles. Amen? And so what happened before that Tuesday, before my parents called me, as Janet and I had, had a discussion, we decided to have Thanksgiving at home and I was going to make a turkey and I was going home that Monday to visit my folks. And uh, Janet had said, well, you know, you should invite them and and, uh, but, you know, if, if they at any point ever say, yes, let's always have it in our home. I'm just too afraid after 28 years to go have Thanksgiving in their home. Let's have it in our home. You know, not that it would ever happen, but just in case it ever would. So I mentioned it to my folks, of course. And, of course, then the next day they called and other plans had fallen through. And so God opened up the door. Sometimes God's looking for us to participate in a miracle. And it's just an inkling. It's a hunch. It's the Holy Spirit overshadowing your mind and you're thinking and you end up saying things and doing things you would normally do because God yeah. wants to do something big. Amen? Yeah. And so God wants to do the miraculous in our life. This morning though, I want to talk about how not only was Jesus' birth miraculous, but his whole ministry was miraculous. In fact, in the Gospels we see that Jesus performed 35 different miracles that we know of. Now, at the end of the Gospel of John, it literally tells us the very last verse of the Gospel of John says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for all the books that would be written. So we don't even know all the miracles that 
took place, but we know that there are 35 different miracles that the gospel writers uh, provided for us, and that doesn't even include the resurrection. And so uh, Jesus' life was not only started with the miraculous, but his whole ministry uh, was, a, was, a, was a ministry of the miraculous. And I believe that Jesus is our example, and God wants to be intervening in all of our lives constantly. And I believe for this Christmas, God wants to do some unusual things that we're going to be in awe of. In the, in the Bible, we see uh, the word signs and wonders. Do you know that God wants to do signs and wonders, signs of his love, signs of confirmation, and wonders, things that make us wonder about the goodness of the Lord. So this morning, I just want to touch on two different miracles. How many of you remember Jesus' first miracle, right? Those of you that like wine, you remember that Jesus turned the water into wine, right? And this is found in John chapter 1, the very first uh, chapter of the Gospel of John. And so Jesus turned water into wine. Now, you know what? He didn't do this because he felt the need to do this. It was actually Mary. Mary must have liked a little bit of wine because she went to this party. And this wedding, normally weddings would last about six or seven days. There was a whole process for the wedding and the whole celebration. And so what happened is that in this wedding feast, they ran out of wine. And apparently, this was a big no-no. Okay, you, you can't have a wedding in, in, in Israel and not have wine last through the whole time. And so they ran out of wine. And so the mother of Jesus goes to him and says, Are you they? You better do something about this. I think that was a little bit Jewish, a little bit Scottish, how it came out. But, you know, Mary said, Jesus, you better do something about this. And what did he say? He said, It's not my time yet. She wanted him to perform a miracle, like, you know, like uh, bewitched. Twitch your nose or something, and boom, there would be wine, you know? But Jesus said, hey, it's not my time yet. I'm not supposed to. There was a time when he was going to be released. But you know what? He obviously must have gone and prayed about it because it tells us later that Jesus only did what he saw his father doing. And so what happened is that Jesus must have decided to think about it and pray about it because he comes back. And he tells the servants, you fill up those jars. And while they were filling up those jars, he then said, uh, fill them up with water. They were probably big stone jars that they filled them up with water. And then he said, uh, take, take that and bring it to the host and have them try it. And so they tried it, and of course it was wine. And so in that whole process, the water turned into wine. And so what we see here is that God's mind literally and the timing of Jesus' release in the ministry was literally changed that day. Why? Because Jesus' mother really had it on her heart that that wedding would have won. You know, God looks at the desires of our hearts. Jesus' ministry started, I believe, a little bit early because this unknown couple that got married, his mother decided they needed some wine that day. Do you know what? God's looking at the desire of our hearts. God wants to make sure that everything in our lives is an abundant life. And God wants to begin to do the miraculous and begin to move in our hearts and lives. But it's going to take somebody partnering with the Lord. Amen? Amen? And so that's the first miracle. But as I began to look at the miracles of Jesus, I was surprised to see the second miracle. And I want to close with this miracle. How many of you know the second miracle that Jesus performed? Okay, anybody? I didn't know the second miracle that Jesus performed. If anybody here knows, you can be the pastor from now on. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'm just kidding. But I, I, just, I just thought it was so awesome because you always are learning new things. So in John chapter 4, so you go from John 1, flipped over to John chapter 4, and verse 46 to 54, I want to read this story because I don't think many of us know the story of this royal officer. Some of the translations say, I believe the King James uh, called this man a, a noble man. We know that he was a man and his son was uh, dying. He was uh, from Capernaum and Jesus is now in Canaan. And so this man had heard about Jesus. He had probably traveled over two days to get 
to meet Jesus and to ask Jesus to come to his home. And so in verse 46, it says, Once more, uh, Jesus visited Canaan, Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. You know, you do one miracle, and uh, all of a sudden, you turn water into wine. And people in that region of Canaan, they all knew about Jesus, didn't they? You know, he, he became the party boy. And so it says, <laughs> There was a certain royal officer whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and to heal his son who was close to death. And it's funny because in verse 48, Jesus says something kind of interesting. He says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. Then verse 49, the royal officer says, Sir, come down before my child dies. So here's this man, and he's begging Jesus. He's heard about Jesus, and he's begging him to come two days' journey and to come to his home uh, to heal his sick son because he has heard that Jesus can turn water into wine. There's probably been other types of miracles going on that are not recorded in this uh, in the Bible. And so he's gone to him because he, he has just a spark of faith that what he's heard about this man, that he can help his son. And then it says in verse 50 that Jesus replied and says, You may go, your son will live. And the man took Jesus at his word and departed. What I love about the story, it says that while he was still on his way, now remember he, he has to travel two days to get back to Capernaum. So while he was still on his way, his servants meet him with the news that his boy is living. And when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at what Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all of his household believed. So I want to talk to you about uh, this particular man and the limitations that he had on uh, Jesus' ability to perform miraculous things in his life and for his son. Because what we see here is that he comes and he asks Jesus, he says, please come to my home and come quickly. And Jesus says to him, hey, you know, uh, you want to see signs and wonders. You want to see something or you won't believe. People want to see signs and wonders or they're not going to believe. What was Jesus saying here? Well, what was happening is that Jesus wanted to stretch this man's faith. He had just a spark of faith. How many of you have ever wondered if you had enough faith to see a miracle happen in your life? This guy had just enough faith. He had heard that some guy could turn water into wine. And he thought, hey, maybe this guy can do something for my son. And so he had a spark of faith. And Jesus said to him, you know what? You want to see in order to believe. And so instead of actually going to this man's house, Jesus then says to him, you go on your way and your son is going to live. And so I believe that what Jesus was doing was helping this man to literally break out of the limitations that he had on Jesus. Jesus can perform a miracle when he's present in your home. He can also perform a miracle just by saying the word. He can perform all kinds of miracles any way that God wants to do it. And so he wanted to touch this man and to help this man to believe in a greater way. What do miracles do? Miracles help us to see God's love, to see God's power, but they also help us to believe. Turn to your neighbor and say, I want to believe in a greater way this, this Christmas season. I want to be amazed, right? And so God wants us to see signs and wonders and miracles in our lives because it helps us to believe God in greater measure. But what we see here is that Jesus wanted to stretch this guy's faith. And so he said, hey, you know, you want to see in order to believe. And Jesus wanted him to believe in him instead of just what he was going to do. Believe in me, not just the wine that you heard about. Believe in me, not just what I'm going to do for your son. And so he said, literally, you go on your way, your son lives. And you know what? This guy, it tells us in the scriptures that he believed, he believed, and he departed. 
And so two things. First of all, the man limited Jesus' power. He thought Jesus had to be present to be able to perform a miracle. Jesus said the word, and that boy was healed that very hour. And the second thing is, is that this man's faith was limited to seeing or to sight. He wanted this man to come home. He wanted him to do something to his son. He probably had every doctor and everybody else over his son. Nothing had worked. He wanted Jesus to come and to do something. And he wanted to see that his son got better. Sometimes God wants to stretch our faith and perform a miracle so that our faith is stretched and we can begin to believe in new ways about what God wants to do. We can begin to go beyond our limitations of how God's going to work in our situation, how God's going to work in our family, how God's going to work in our, our relationships, how God's going to work in bringing Mr. or Miss Wright into our lives, how God is going to work in our finances, how God is going to work in the area of jobs and careers and contracts and everything. How God can bring to us houses and homes and vehicles the things that we need. How God wants to get the gospel into this region. God wants to do things even beyond our limited thinking, right? And so what we see here is that Jesus wanted to help this man go from having a spark of faith to having his faith stretched so that he could begin to believe God in a greater way. I want to encourage you today that God is looking at the desires of your heart and that God is looking at the limitations that you have upon him and God's wanting to stretch us this season so that we can truly begin to believe and to see the things that God wants to do miraculously in our lives. Would you rise as you're able? Amen? How did it do? Not too bad. Praise the Lord. That's as close as we're going to probably get. Amen? I want, you to, I want you to decree this morning. I want to get past limited thinking. I want to get past limited ways. I want to get past putting God in a box. And I want to be amazed at the things that God is going to do in my life. You know what? We can begin to think and to plan how we want God to do things. But God wants to blow our thinking. God wants to just do the miraculous. God wants to wow you. God wants to cause you to wonder. God wants there to be signs that are going to follow his word as you begin to believe in his word. God wants you to begin to be amazed just as Jesus and just as Jesus moved people beyond where they were, I believe that this season God wants to move each and every one of us beyond where we are, beyond where we've been believing, beyond where we've been thinking, to begin to believe for the miraculous, for God's touch in that area that's been dead, that's been lifeless, where we've been afraid, where we've been thinking it's never going to change. Oh, I, I tell you what, the day after I left my folks home, I remember that next day, Tuesday, I thought to myself, I don't think my folks will ever walk into my home and have dinner with Janet and I. I was so surprised when I got that call that night. God wants to go beyond our thinking and just surprise us. But sometimes we've got to step out and just let our limited thinking be removed so that Jesus can begin to stretch our faith. Those areas that we thought they're never going to take place. They're never going to happen. God wants to do the miraculous. God wants to bring wonder into this season. I'm telling you, this is a word of the Lord. I know it because God spoke to me so clearly about it. And this morning, if you're in a place that you want to see God touch your life, you want to see the love of the Lord this Christmas season, you want to see God do something great in your life, but you're going to have to move beyond that limited thinking and let God just be God. God wants to go beyond where you are. And I believe that God's going to bring wonder into the season, into your life. Are you ready to see that take place? Yes. Amen. I want you just to lift up your hand to the Lord this morning. God, I believe that you have spoken to me that this church is going to experience a season of wonder, a season of miracles, a season, God, where you're going to bring us into a time almost like in the New Testament era where we're going to see signs and wonders and miracles just happen all the time. Lord, it's because you're, you're coming to reside in our lives and to partner with us.
us in a greater measure than what we ever thought possible. Let there be healing of body. Let there be healing of finances. Let there be healing in relationships. Let there be healings in homes. God, let there be all kinds of areas in our lives where you touch us. That you begin to pour out your love in those areas that we have not experienced them, Lord. And we thank you for it. We want to be people that are, that are in awe of you this season, Lord. But most of all, God, we know it's because of your son, Jesus. We thank you for sending him. We thank you that he was born. We thank you that he was born miraculously the only way that he could be our Savior. We thank you, God, that he was brought into this earth because of the Holy Spirit and because of a woman named Mary who would say yes to God's plan. And I pray, God, that throughout the next few weeks that each one of us would begin to say yes to your Holy Spirit, that we would begin to say yes to your purpose and your plan for our lives. When we're to speak to someone, when we're to open up a door, when we're to stretch our faith and to step out some way. God, let us believe that you are the God of your word, that you will perform miracles on our behalf. And we thank you for that, Lord. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We thank you, God, for what you're doing. We say, do it again, Lord. Do it again. What you've done before, do it again. We want to see your touch. We want to see miracles all over this place. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. I'm so glad that you came. I hope you feel a little bit warmer now. And I will look forward to seeing you next Sunday here. Also, those of you that are coming to the uh, Newport Harbor boat, we encourage you to try to get there at 3 o'clock, even though it doesn't leave until 3.45, just because of parking issues. Please plan ahead. Uh, the boat will be taken off at 3.45, whether you're on it or on it. Can I do the video? So please uh, try to get there early. All right, God bless you. Thank you. Okay.